All right. He should see vanu ladun bahaforas nadorin. So the, the next mitzvah, number 95, is what is called nullification of vows. And that is that a husband or a father, in the case of a minor, is able to nullify a vow. So if somebody makes a neder, a binding vow, they are now obliged to follow it. So let's say, for instance, somebody decided that um, the, their ch chocolate cake is a great nemesis and they are not going to uh, be able to stay on their diet if they eat, if, if they are tempted by chocolate cake. So they've decided to forbid chocolate cake to themselves with a netter because they're making the assumption that if I know it's really forbidden for me for eat it, I won't eat it. I don't, for instance, I don't have a desire to eat pork or um, bacon, let's say. I don't have a desire to eat bacon, even though I would like to eat bacon, but I don't feel that I have a desire to eat bacon. So um, if I would make chocolate cake in the same category as bacon, then I would have gotten past a great stumbling block on the way to my losing weight. So I'm thinking like that. And therefore I make a netter that I am uh, uh, not going to eat chocolate cake. So at this point, eating chocolate cake is biblically forbidden to me. Once I make that netter, it becomes biblically forbidden for me to eat that chocolate cake. Because if I eat that chocolate cake, I'll be violating my netter and that's biblically forbidden. So um, there might be people who have thought like that. And, uh, but what ends up happening is that it's a greater struggle than they assumed. So you might have uh, a husband who has been through this before and he hears about the netter and he, he has the power to nullify it. And just to say, as long as it's within a day of hearing the netter, he has, he has the power to nullify the netter. It's like the netter, um, the netter is no longer in force. He can do that. Um, for his wife, and he could do it for a minor daughter. Um, and ostensibly, this is for family dynamics to just. What about for it. himself, Rabbi? No. Once he makes a netter, he has to keep it. Now, the, uh, and nobody, you can't undo your own netter, even, um, even if it's just, let's say, a half an hour later. You can't undo. Uh, your own netter. Once you've made a netter, you're you're bound to follow it. What you could do is you could go to a, a sage and have them annul the netter. Um, but a sage will only annul a netter if you can demonstrate that uh, there was information that you came across, they, what they call a Pesach an opening, uh, you have to communicate that there was something, had you known it at the time you made the netter, you wouldn't have made the netter. That's, that's the kind of thing that you have to do. Otherwise, they're not going to annul it. Whereas a, a father or husband, they can annul it without any, for, you know, there doesn't have to be any opening. They, they just hear about it and they go, I annul it. Um, so Good that life. is, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you spoke about a minor daughter. How 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 can a minor make a binding letter? So there, so up until so there's there's like an it's called the age of Nadarim. There's like a, it's about a year before they become an adult. Minor children um, can make binding Nadarim. It's uh, um, it's a sort of a rare 
phenomena that even though they're not of age, there's something that they can do that can have biblical consequences. But there is something, it's called like the age of Nadorim, and it's about a year or so before adulthood. Um, and so this would, that would be the, uh, the, uh, it's a brief window for a father to do it for a daughter. Okay, so uh, that is that he commanded us to administer the nullification of vows, meaning the precept that he instructed us about these laws. However, the content is not that we are obligated to annul vows no matter what. You should understand this issue itself for me. Anytime you hear me counting one of the laws as a commandment, it doesn't mean that it's compulsory. Rather, it's a commandment by virtue of our being commanded to administer this law for the thing when it arises. He had said this before, like about divorce or things. It's not that there's a mitzvah to get a divorce. It's just that if you're getting a divorce, it's a mitzvah to do it this way. That the husband and the father can annul them is, behold, already explained in scripture. But the tradition comes and informs us that a sage can also annul a vow. Now, he's including this in this mitzvah, even though the fact that a sage can do it is not learned out, it is, is, is learned out from uh, the oral law. Uh, there is no written law about a sage doing it, um, as well as an oath. And the hint to this is in his saying, he may not void his word, lo yachel devoro. He may not void his word, but others may void it for him. More generally, there is certainly no proof to this from the scripture. And they say the annulment of vows floats in the air. Again, it's talking about the rabbis. The fact that fathers and husbands can annul vows, that is overtly discussed in the Torah. In fact, it, it, it's discussed at length. Um, the fact that a sage can do it, that is entirely uh, from the oral law. And even though he brought a verse that sort of suggests towards it, but you see from the Gemara and Chagiga, the annulment of vows floats in the air. It doesn't have any bona fide support, but is rather known from the true tradition. In other words, it's purely, purely oral tradition. That's what he means from the true tradition. And the regulation of this commandment have already been explained in Tractate Nadorim, see Parshas Matos. So again, there are, there are really three ways this can work. You have, uh, let's say you have a daughter who makes an oath when she's 11 and shows uh, the intelligence um, of a young adult. So she, she makes a vow, the father annuls it. Or a wife makes a vow and the husband annuls it. Those are discussed in the Torah. Somebody making a vow and a sage annulling it, that is not written in the Torah, that is learned from the oral law. And again, he did at first, because the Gemara does this, when the, when the Gemara, met, you know, this, there's a Mishnah that mentions it, but then the Gemara discusses it. Uh, and, and the Gemara says, what do you mean? What about this? What about that? What about this? And, it, and, it, and they try to give all sorts of places where it is hinted to. Uh, but the conclusion is that it may seem like that to you, but there really is no actual textual source for it. It's completely oral law. So, but it is something that can happen and you can avail yourself of. I have done it or I've gone to a, a sage after I um, made a vow about something and had them annul it. The Gemara makes it very clear that it doesn't, support the idea of making vows it doesn't it's clear from the gemara that as a regular practice it's it's very frowned upon um that that the in fact that they suggest it's the it's the way of wicked people to to uh, regularly make vows uh, even if you keep them it's, it's not recommended because it's a path towards this. There are a lot of things where you think you're gonna handle it with vows and then you find that it's out of control and you can't handle it. And, uh, and then um, you're violating 
a vow every time, uh, let's say it was about smoking or drinking or, or something like that. Um, and uh, you just think you're gonna be able to handle it with a vow and you find out that it's bigger than a vow. And before you know it, you're violating these vows and that's considered a tragic a circumstance. It's much better not to make these vows. On the other hand, they're there for a reason. We see great people made vows. We see Yaakov uh, uh, famously um, made a vow that he said, if God takes care of him, as he promises, then he will um, um, uh, give a tithe and he will anoint this place as a special place. And you see the Torah takes it very seriously. At one point, God says, go back and fulfill that vow you said you were going to do. Um, so you see- Rabbi, oh, yeah. go ahead, finish. No, that go ahead. I, okay, no, yeah. um, if a, a husband, um, annuls a vow that a wife made does it have to does against her will can he I mean she can still you know keep whatever it is but she won't be under a vow anymore can you know can yes. he do it against her will <laughs> yes but the Gemara qualifies it and makes it clear that there's only certain kinds of vows that he actually can can control one is if it's between the two of them. So if she makes a vow about something in their relationship, that he for sure can annul. The other one is if there's some element of suffering, if there's going to be some element of suffering. But if it's not either of those, like for instance, let's say she says she's going to make a vow that she's going to... Uh, uh, say to Hillam every day for a month or something. It, it's it's very possible that he cannot annul something like that. He can only annul something that's between the two of them, or will have some element of suffering. He he he, he might argue, you know, even something like that. It could get in the way, um, you know, because let's say there's something that they're supposed to be doing, but she can't do it because she said she's going to say this thing of Tehillim, but it's very unlikely because it doesn't take that long to say something from Tehillim. But yes, in theory, because again, the there's a, a kind of expectation um, of that the husband or the father are in charge of a larger family dynamic. And in and if if you're in charge of a larger family dynamic and somebody can make oaths that are binding oaths that would somehow interfere with the family dynamic, you're really not in charge of the family dynamic. So, um, you know, if somebody uh, is saying, we're gonna, we're gonna move, and this person makes an oath that they're not moving. So they would uh, in, put a wrench in, um, you know, the ultimate decision-making of the family. So that's how it's typically understood, even though it's not explicitly stated, but that's how it's typically understood that he's responsible for managing the family dynamic in general. And this could really put a wrench in decision making. So therefore, this gives him the power to just uh, um, to eliminate those things that get in the way. But if it would be something that wouldn't get in the way of the family dynamic, it's just a private issue of hers that and and he can't make he can't demonstrate that it would get in the way then he doesn't have power over that uh, we, there's uh, we were talking like uh, originally about uh, uh let's let's say a wife who made a vow and the husband now he can annul the thing on that very day but he has to do it that day right right what about a sage is his power limited just to that day or he could he, he can do it anytime he could do it any time. And there's other, can't you also do it if you have like three kosher Jews, that, you know? To, right, so really it's a baked in, but, but a one sage can, uh, has the same authority as a baked in, but really, really it, it is a baked in. So that's when we do, um, hat, we call it Hattaras Nadarim, the, uh, when, when the sages are doing it. So on Erev Rosh Hashanah, it's a custom. I think I asked 
uh, some Sephardim, if they do it, and I think they said they also do do it. I don't know if they do it Arab Rosh Hashanah, but they also do it at Taurus Nadarim uh, as a formal annual process. If you look in the small print, that does not work for it. The, we sort of, we say in the Hatars and Darim itself, uh, the one that we do on Arab Rosh Hashanah, that we're only doing this for ones that qualify for that kind of uh, Hatara. If it is a specific one, and it may not, it, it may be something that requires um, a scholar's input. So that is not meant for for Arab Rosh Hashanah. So like for instance, uh, uh, included in the Dorim are practices uh, that's, that let's say somebody took it upon himself to, to do a, um, a, a particular thing or to not do a particular thing because um, of what we call a Khumra. So uh, for instance, I, I, when I was in high school, Ravar and Salav, I went to Yeshiva with Ravar and Salavetra was my Rosh Yeshiva at Brisk. And he uh, did not carry in Eruvs uh, unless the Eruv was a, a very small Eruv. Uh, so for instance, it, he would carry if you made an Eruv in his backyard or let's say there was an Eruv between two houses that didn't have to cross a street. So he would make those kind of Eruvs, but otherwise he wouldn't carry in Eruvs. And so when, um, when I was in high school, I didn't carry in Eruvs. Then when I went to Israel, I also didn't carry in Eruvs. Um, so as a, as a Bacher, so for like the first six years I was living in Israel, I was single. And uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't carry in the Eruv on Shabbos. Then I got married. And so when we first got married, I continued to not carry uh, on Shabbos. I didn't insist my wife didn't, but I didn't carry on Shabbos in Eruv. Then we had a baby. So now I'm not carrying an Eruv, but my wife is. So it ends up my wife on Shabbos is the one that has to push the carriage and, and schlep the baby because I can't carry. This is, this was, you know, untenable situation. Um, and so I went to Rav Scheinberg about this. Um, and, and Rav Scheinberg said, it's okay. You say Kol Nidre every year. So he said Kol Nidre. I, I don't know why he didn't say Hataras Nadarim, but he said Kol Nidre, because Kol Nidre is also um, a kind of declarative, uh, a, a declaration. But, but the thing about Kol Nidre that's different than going to a sage is that Kol Nidre, uh, what you're saying is, I am not taking Nadarim See, I never said this in the language of a netter. I never said, I now make a netter that I'm not carrying. I, I never said that. I just practiced not carrying, but that's a rule. You see this in the Gemara and other places that if you do a practice, especially one that's connected to a mitzvah or a, what we would call a chumrah, where you're being extra careful, that can become, that can get the force of a netter. Because, because you're doing it. Um, and so for that, Ruf Scheinberg was saying, you never took it on as a netter because you, you say kol nidre. That's part of the point of saying kol nidre. You're making a declaration at the beginning of the year that if you do any kind of uh, uh, something, a netter-like, or, or even if you say, I'm going to do, even if I would, from kol nidre, it says, even if I would say it as a netter, I don't want it to take effect. That's what I'm saying at the beginning. So it wouldn't take effect. Now in Hattaras Nidarin, if you look at the language there, the one on Erev Pesach, on Erev Rosh Hashanah, there you actually say, or any good act, any Hanhaga Tova, any like good minhag or good something that I start taking upon myself, uh, I want you to cancel it. 
So, but there, the difference between Ataris Nadarim and Kol Nidre is in Ataris Nadarim, I'm asking for an annulment for one that already got a status of nether, whereas in Kol Nidre, I'm, asked, I'm just making a statement that it should never get the status of nether. So when I went to Rav Scheinberg that time, he was essentially saying, you don't need Hataras Nedarim because you never took it on. And the reason you never took it on as a netter was because you said every Kol Nidre that you're not. And those words do have teeth. It, even if I would have said, I'm doing it as a netter, unless I said, even though I said Kol Nidre, I don't want Kol Nidre to apply. Then, then if I said that, then Kol Nidre would not apply. But otherwise, Kol Nidre also works to get rid of uh, Nidorim, uh, it's preemptive. So one more time, Rabbi, Kol Nidre doesn't apply to what now? I'm a little mixed up here. Kol Nidre, the way, uh, when we rely on Kol Nidre, we are, for the most part, making a preemptive statement that any behavior that could turn into a netter or any statement of netter that I make during this next year should be considered null and void. It's, I'm saying it now. I'm saying that even if I say those words, I don't mean it and do not count it as a netter and that works. So uh, I might be moved in a particular situation to commit to doing something. I may even use the language of netter when I'm committing to doing it, but I don't mean it. I'm saying it right now. That's, and that actually works and preemptively makes it so that there never was a netter. That's different than annulling a netter. And by the way, there are, you'll notice in parentheses in a lot of Sidurim where they're actually doing a, a kind of Hattoras Nadarim where you're where you're asking for the nidorim that you already made in the previous year to be annulled. But a lot of times in the Sidurim, those are in parentheses because it's very questionable whether that can work in that format. Because there are three sages at the holding Torahs at the Bima, but you're not really saying to them, it's not like Hattaras Nadarim where you're actually saying it to the people and they're ostensibly listening to you. There, you're just mumbling it. They don't hear you even say it. You're saying it very softly. The Chazan's the one who's saying it loudly. Um, so you'll see in a lot of Sidurim, they'll be, it'll be in parentheses where you're asking that the Nidurim of the previous year be annulled. And that the real force uh, of Kol Nidre is for the years, for the year coming. That there's no question that I should be able to do that, a kind of preemptive statement that no matter what you hear coming from my mouth, I'm telling you right now, I don't mean it. I don't mean it. I certainly don't mean it to be a netter. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So that is that. No, you ask him. Oh, I don't yeah. understand. Um, <laughs> David, one, what about a court mandated nader? Is what is that? Right. So those would those could be exceptions. I mean, those are usually shavua, not a netter. But those those are usually to verify the truth of something. They're not they're not to take upon yourself an obligation. There's no court mandated uh, nedarim where where they say you must make a netter that you're not going to eat chocolate cake. They they don't that when they when a court mandates a shavua. They're trying to, to find out if you told the truth. Right, so um, it is true. They are exceptions to the Hattaras Nadorim, or, but they, but they, it really doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't cover, anyways, you're, when you're preemptively saying, I, I, uh, nothing is a shvur and neder, that is true that a court mandated one will not fall under this category, but the court mandated ones are, are um, always about telling the truth. I, so that might be like you, somebody said, 
that I owe them a hundred dollars, I say I I paid back fifty. So now I have a court mandated oath that I'm supposed to take that I that I paid back the fifty that I only owe fifty. So that is true that the Kol Nidre doesn't uh, affect this, but also Kol, here when I'm when I'm saying the Shvua, I'm not accepting on myself an obligation. I'm just swearing that I'm telling the truth. That's it. I so see. They're, they're not the same kind of shoes. Okay. Rabbi, doing. this is probably obvious, but if you take a netter that you're going to do something and then you can't, let's say you say, I'm going to practice piano every morning and then your hands get paralyzed. Is there something you should do or say or how? Well, they will. Yeah, they will. Formally, you should ask for an annulment of the netter. Formally. Would that be a case of bonus? Yes, it would, but still formally they would ask you to to do a mm -hmm. Torah ta There, There is a... Um, I broke all my fingers. There is, right, there is something called onus in the, in the Doran. I mean, there's something called onus when it comes to any mitzvah in the Torah. This would this would be like other mitzvahs in the Torah. And, uh, but there, um, still, you'll you'll see that they'll they'll still ask for it because I mean you could see that there could be some gray areas where you may think you can't do it but maybe you could have or technically should have so but yes the concept of onus does apply and onus means that something happened beyond your control that doesn't allow you to fulfill the conditions of the matter but like we we had uh Again, there's there's like uh, there's um, a case of it's not it's not netter, but it, it's a discussion of onus. Uh, let's say somebody said he he gave his wife. We happen to be doing track take kitten in Dafiomi. So let's say somebody gave his wife a divorce. He wrote out the divorce document and he gave it to her and he said. <clears throat> you'll be divorced if I don't come back in 30 days. So for whatever reason, they, they set up something and, and she didn't want him to go or he, or, or maybe he was worried he's never coming back. So he gave her a divorce and he said, if I don't come back within 30 days, you will have this divorce from today. So let's say it was June 1st. He gave her the divorce on June 1st. And he said, um, if I don't come back in 30 days, which will be, let's say, July, uh, June, June 30th or July 1st, um, if I don't come back, let's say, by July 1st, then you're divorced from June 1st. That's what he says to her. He hands her the divorce. She accepts it. So now it's the day he's supposed to come back. And the Gemara says that he, you know, he... He said, come back to our town. I'm, I'm going to come back to this town. So on the border of the town, there's a river. And he's on the other side of the river. And the river just happens, happens to, uh, so, and he's shouting from the other side of the river. There's no ferry to cross him. So he's shouting from the other side of the river, I'm here. I'm here. You see, I'm here. Now, technically, he's not in the town, but he's shouting from the other side of the river, I'm here. I'm here. And so um, the sage Shmuel said, tough, you're divorced because you're not, you said you were going to come back to the town and you didn't come back to the town. You're on the other side of the river. So they ask over there, you know, what about onus? Isn't this a case of onus? He, he, he couldn't get across the river. There's no boat coming across. So you'll see in the commentaries, they, they will say that that's not called he may have an onus at the at that moment, but he could have planned better. It's his problem that he didn't plan better. So this is the problem with onus, which is that sometimes you could say, well, something came up and what can I do? It's beyond my control. But the question is, do we step back and look at the bigger, at the bigger picture? Um, and is it possible that had you planned better, then you wouldn't have had this problem? So you contribute to it. 
And so you could see why you don't want to rely on onus uh, as, uh, entirely, because even if you as sort of have onus, but there could be, maybe there's a way to get around this. Maybe there's a way, even though your fingers are broken, maybe there's still some kind of practice you could be doing. You could be doing footwork on the pedals or I don't know what. So just for pragmatic reasons, <laughs> that's a big note. <laughs> you know, uh, for it. maybe there's that guy. Uh, there's a famous joke about uh, the Israeli army that um, people were coming for exemptions to the army, and uh, so there's somebody who came who's blinded in one eye and wanted exemption, and they said Moshe Dayan was in the army, so uh, you can't get an. You're not getting an exemption. So it's like uh, that same kind of thing. Again, like you you might think that you are an onus, but maybe others may not. Or Okay. Um, all right. So we are going to go to, uh, to the next one tomorrow um, on Tuesday, sadly. This will not happen too often, but uh, this Monday class that I teach, they, they want to meet a couple of times in person. And if I meet with them in person, I can't do our Rambam class. And we haven't met in since long, even before COVID in person. And so I want to give it a, a few chances, even though I know it means we can't meet. I'm sorry about that. So next week is what now? So we're going to meet Tuesday, okay. Tuesday, not Monday. Tuesday What's now. the definition of onus again in English? Onus means something, I mean, it's a one word that requires several words in English, but something beyond your control, okay. a barrier and uh, something that prevents you from following through that is beyond your control. Okay. Um, and yeah, okay. okay. All right. Rabbi, quickly, yeah. uh, a friend sent me an, um, a review of a new book, I think it's new, on the Rambam, and it's, uh, the last name is Manuel, or so, Alberto Manuel or something, and it, it's called Maimonides' Faith in Reason, and the review makes it sound like, it's for general people who, you know, non-Jewish everything, just to talk about yeah. Maimonides, and it makes it sound like Maimonides is Spinoza. <laughs> In a way, to me, because everything just follows from reason, everything, which of course I, is I, a little wonder, simplistic. Well, even the Rambam says that the Rambam himself, we saw where the Rambam did, didn't say that. Where the right. Rambam, because we saw the Rambam said that if you have a tradition, then even though, so for instance, uh, creation uh, ex nihilo. So the Rambam said that. If it wouldn't be for the fact that we have that where the Torah said it, Aristotle, you know, would make sense. But we happen to have the Torah says that God, you know, that that everything is created. So so you see the Rambam said this in, in several places that if the Torah says it. Then it's right. a fact, whether right. you got a reason or not. Certainly Spinoza would not agree with that. That's Yes. And also, sure. I've heard people say that the Rambam was the first conservative rabbi, and you know they have. Ah. <laughs> How, you okay. can say that if you just read one section of the Rambam, and you don't right. read anything. Yeah, yeah right. And this this man does say that everything he relies on are secondary sources. You know, he doesn't actually read the well. He read the guide. He said, but anyway. he said he read the guide. Yeah, I think he said he read the guide. Yeah. That was the one he read in English, obviously. He doesn't speak right. you know, Arabic. Anyway, just wanted to tell you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay. Easy Thank you. Thank you. you bye too. Bye. You too. Be well. Be well. Thanks, Rabbi. All right. Bye-bye.